If nothing else, Malice Darkblade, you can be counted on to react to adversity with as much violence as physically possible. The Tyrant of the Hag has come to Warhammer 2, and he's ready to deal with his inner demons, or, at the very least, unleash them. Zarkan, the drinker of worlds, yearns to take control and slake his thirst on the mortal plane, and today, that is just what he's gonna do, because we're playing with the Shadow and the Blade DLC, and our boy Malice has a date with Destiny. Two multiplayer battles against the High Elves and the Lizardmen, and our opponent will be Janet on occasion. Now, Bad Elf McBlackSword is an armor-piercing duelist with the ability to shift into an altogether more hellish form. And he's got some company. The Medusa of Grodd, Siren of Red Ruin, a creature cursed by the gods, now pledged to torment all who look upon her sexy snakes. And she is a terror. Straight up, one of the most impressive additions in this entire DLC, both from a visual and a performance perspective. Scourge Runner Chariots harry the flanks in search of large prey to snare with their harpoons, and the Dark Elves have some serious competition. The heir of Anarion marches to war with a host of spearmen and silver helms. See if Malice Darkblade has what it takes to bring down his hated rival. So, Malice is a pretty interesting character from a gameplay perspective. His shtick revolves around dealing minor backlash damage to himself to get incredibly powerful buffs. And when he finally gives in to the demon Zarkan, he gets an insane but time-limited power spike before he collapses unconscious. Because when he converts, he starts losing HP real fast, but his ward saves and regen from the warp sword of Cain can help counteract that. His cold one spite is one of the most recognizable mounts in the new world, trusty boy leading none other than the knights of the Ebon Claw, and a sorceress with power from darkness, word of pain, and soul stealer with the siren of red ruin nearby which is quickly becoming my favorite unit in this entire DLC, and I think there's a very good chance Medusas are one of the best units in the entire Shadow and Blade. They are incredibly versatile, with a brutal sonic scream attack, and the ability to get stuck into melee as well. But Scourge Runner Chariots out on the flanks are also really well designed, and they're kind of a lighter variant than their Cold One Cousins. They're really only meant to kill light troops in melee, but they have 40 bonus for large on their range attack, and the Ravagers of Rakarth, Regiment of Renown, have a barb net passive that lowers enemy missile resist and speed in an AoE, which is really useful when you're hammering away at like enemy knights with harpoon bolts or enemy monsters. Now for Janet on occasion and the High Elves, it's just a horde of spearmen and archers with a lore master of Hoath equipped with his cloak, blessed tome, Spirit Leech, and Earthblood, and a heavy cavalry force of Silverhelms, with Tyrion leading the vanguard. And the entire idea here is that the High Elves really like pushing and out-muscling the Dark Elves in that cavalry fight. But with Malice and Dread Knights in support, it's not going to be very easy for them. The Knights of the Ebon Claw, one-on-one, -on -one, can crush Silverhelms in a fight. The question is, can Malice Darkblade take on Tyrion in a 1v1 fight, one of the better duelists in the game? And the Azur also have a big advantage in numbers here. It's a really wide build, a lot of heavy calf. That's what the Chariots and Dark Rider crossbows are for. Equalize those numbers a bit and harass the crap out of them before they have a chance to get their charge bonus off. That is something that Scourge Runner Chariots are extremely good at doing, especially the Ravagers of Rakarth with that speed and missile resist debuff. So what they want to do is move out to the flank, use their maneuverability and their Parthian shot because they can fire in a 360 degree arc, and any cavalry that chases after is going to get slammed over and over again by bonus first large projectiles, which can quickly delete a lot of models out of those units. So, going to move up on the flanks here, try to do some harassing and just annoy the crap out of all the cavalry, whittle down their numbers, and give that Red Ruin Siren a little bit of time to do some skirmishing. And this is something that I was not expecting to see, an extremely powerful range attack out of them, but it's dirty. I mean, it will straight up murderize infantry, especially tightly packed, low armor infantry. They get destroyed by that volley. I mean, that was one shot, one attack from long range, killed 19 high elf spearmen immediately. So yeah, it's mean. She's mean. It's not as good for single entities, but if you can get her firing into blobs of infantry or grail knights or dragon princes, she can quickly make her cost back. Now I had to move her backwards. Tyrion will beat the brakes off her in 1v1 combat. She doesn't have bad melee stats, but she's no Tyrion. And she also got Spear Leech, so it's time to retreat. But the Scourge Runner Chariots are doing exactly what I want them to do. Just hammer those Silver Helms all day long with bonus for large projectiles and make them very sad. And you can see, they are racking up some serious DPS against all that heavy cavalry. And that's going to be very necessary because my infantry is going to get demolished by a frontal charge from Silver Helms. And she can even get stuck into melee. She's got a whale ability, an AoE, that will do about 600 to 700 damage 
to any unit caught within the radius. So she can cast that twice, combine that with all her other utility and her DPS, and she is very, very impressive for a price point at 1750. So the Scourge Runner Chariots on the other flank doing the exact same thing, pissing off the Silver Helms, making them real sad, getting them down to about half HP, and already melee combat going to begin in earnest. Malice Darkblade and the Cold One Dread Knights thinking about getting stuck in. Shooting Projectile, it does not seem to penetrate cavalry. It will only penetrate against infantry, but again, if you're firing into high tier cav like Grail Knights or Dragon Princes, important to remember that your range attack is magical, so it'll penetrate through the physical resist, which is super nice. And you kill a model each time, gonna be super worth it. Dread Knight's trying to quickly get rid of the Azur Spearmen with a frontal charge, and she's on an island unto herself, but these Silver Helms are already severely depleted, and she's definitely got the melee stats to do well in this fight, and she also causes terror, so as soon as anything comes in to reinforce, gonna be good. Witch Elves coming in to make sure that they can get tar pitted in place. As soon as they rampage, the rest of the Dark Elves can slam into that flank and delete the rest of the cavalry. But Tyrion and Silver Helms up the center are a problem, and it looks like Sunfang is gonna do what it does best, deleting Druki infantry from the game. Ouch. That hurt. HP dropping to zero, essentially, and those bleak swords are going to be out of the fight. So when he's in his regular form, Malice has two abilities. The Demon's Curse, which causes minor backlash to himself. It lowers melee defense and leadership of enemies in an AoE. 24 and 16, I believe, which is pretty disgusting. And Blood Price, also hurts himself, gives 60% weapon damage, AP, and a 22% ward save. And when you give him to Zarkin, you get all your HP back and some powerful new abilities. So you want to wait until Malice is almost dead, to unleash the Drinker of Worlds. That's how you get the most value out of him. But once you're Zarkin, an HP drain kicks in and it gets nasty real quick. There's really no way to keep him alive for long at that point, but you become unbreakable and just lawn mow stuff once you go Super Saiyan. So you're trading longevity for a vicious power spike. Not there yet. Just going into melee with archers. Don't need to unleash Zarkin at this point in the battle, but he is making a pretty big impact. I mean, we're into the back line now, alongside that Siren of Red Ruin. The Medusa is using that speed, that mobility, and that mass to just bound through enemy formations, rip and tear until it is done. And I love that Wolverine claw she's got in her left hand. She's a southpaw stance. Yeah, she's gonna carve people up real nice. So, Terror Route kicking in on the Azur battle line. Things are looking pretty good. Earthblood going down, trying to heal him up. And Tyrion looking pretty strong on the high elf left flank, but in the center. And in their back, all the archers getting run down by the speed and the mobility. While well, the Scourge Runner chariots are hounding all the archers and the cavalry. And the deuce is not done yet. Whale of Malice will shatter their sanity and sunder their bones. And she is living up to her name for sure. Red Ruin indeed. This is what I love about Medusa so far. They're able to seamlessly transition from range combat to melee and then back to range, quickly cause terror routes, get a couple good shots in, then charge right back into melee. So they have a ton of utility, ton of battlefield presence when micro well. I'm in love with them so far, but they do have low armor, very low armor. They have a big hitbox and enemy missile play like archer spam for the high elves will take them to pound town pretty quick, which is why it was so important to shut them down early. And these Ravagers over Karth, not in the right spot, tied down by Silverhelms, trying to escape, but having a rough go of it so far. And the Dark Elves have taken over on the left side of the battlefield, while the Azur have taken over on the right. Malice and the Siren of Red Ruin working back to back, causing terror routes wherever they go. Malice is in good shape right now. He's barely taken any damage. In fact, all the damage he's taken so far pretty much been from his own spells and his own activated abilities. But the Sorceress is in a bad spot. I realized at this point, okay, she might get caught out by Malhendir. The Tyrion's super fast, obviously one of the fastest uh, on horseback in the game. And so she ran away, popped the Soul Sealer to get some value out of that spell. Wasn't a great cast, but was hoping it'd be enough. She managed to escape though, and now Malice going in, popping all his abilities and fighting. And I've got some backup too, Bleak Swords coming in. That should be enough to do really well. And look at that, only taking one hit so far, Tyrion has gotten dropped down to pretty close to half. Lord Master of Hoath is coming in, Silver Helms are coming in to reinforce, and there are a bunch of Azur Spearmen still left on the battlefield, which is something we have to be very cognizant of, be aware of. The, not Widowmaker, the Sunfang will rip through, but eh, I'm not too worried about it. Gonna kill a few Dark Elf Spearmen, but they're, they were gonna die anyway. And Tyrion is losing this duel in a 1v1 fight to Malice Darkblade, which is awesome. I like seeing that. I wanna see Tyrion die here. 
So I'm thinking, okay, this is pretty good. I've got the Siren coming in with the rear charge, popping her Whale of Doom, and it's actually not very good for single entities at all. It is meant to be used more like a Flock of Doom against big groups of infantry, but at this point, I realize I just need as much damage as possible to take them down. Tyrion popping all his defensive abilities, though, and when he's got Faint and Repost up, when he's got his defense buffs up, he gets up to like 100-100 almost, and he doesn't take very many hits at all. Finally wears off. Malice and the Sorcerer's gooting up. Lost my Siren of Red Ruin. Tyrion got a couple attacks and armor piercing was too much for her. And then Tyrion, guess what? Gets his Heart of Avalorn proc. Goes all the way up to almost 3,000 HP. Well over 2,000 anyway. And now we're in a position where things are very bad. And I was thinking, I'm in good shape right now. I've got this. I can now cast Zarkin, unleash the Drinker of Worlds. And that was really unfortunate. Because the balance bar swung super heavily in the High Elf's favor in an instant because of that Heart of Avalorn proc. Army losses kicked in way sooner than I was expecting. I popped Zarkan in time, but unfortunately, he gets replaced. Malice gets replaced by a new unit when you summon the Drinker of Worlds. So what happened was, the game looked at my army and said, oh, there's nothing left on the field for any pride from Milk and Cookies Total War. Everything else is routing from army losses, so it doesn't matter that Zarkan is unbreakable. He wasn't on the field yet. There's that half-second gap where there was no unit, and that was enough for the game to just end. Now, I don't think Zarkan would have been quite enough to win that game, but he would have been able to kill Tyrion easily in a 1v1 duel, and I would have loved to see him make a last stand there. Didn't happen. Sorry to see that interaction, but it was a good learning experience, and it's good for you guys to know this as well, that you need to wait before, or, or you need to pop the ability before army losses kicks in, because there is that tiny little gap where if he's the only guy left in the field, it doesn't matter. He's not going to come in in time, because the rest of your army is gone. So very good to learn that. What I did learn, though, from all my games so far, is that the Siren of Red Ruin and Medusas are very strong when microed well. I mean, she was a beast that game. She did so much for me. And the Scourge Runner and Chariots were also incredibly impressive. But, fear not. Look, we didn't get to unleash Zarkin in that battle, but we got more battles coming. It's a 30 minute video, not a 15 minute video. Let's jump into another one and show off what Zarkin can do when you do unleash him. This was a very weird battle, I'm not gonna lie. I think Jan on occasion might end up uploading it on his own channel. So if you wanna see this full one, Go check it out over there. Link will be in the pinned comment and description below. But this was a battle where Malice had a horrible start. Janet brought two giants, and he also brought Skarsnik, who has that bonus for large, and a lot of mass when he's running around alongside Gobla. So Malice went in and got pounded on by two giants and Gobla and Skarsnik, and he started out with almost no HP because of it. He had done nothing up to this point. I had to run away. He's super low but you have that nice back pocket. You say, okay, well, yeah, Malice is about to die, but I can unleash Zarkin at any point, and he's gonna go back up to full HP and get some really powerful new abilities. And there are two of them. Besides becoming unbreakable and just having your stat line shift more towards an offensive capacity, just by nature of the transformation, you get Bloodstorm, grants a 22% ward save for nine seconds and an explosion, kind of like Verminous Valor for Queek, that absolutely butchers low armor infantry. Like I've seen it get like 30 kills easy. And Reaper of Souls, basically Soul Stealer with a cast point around Zarkin, which heals himself, quite useful alongside the Warp Sword of Cain for the regen there, and can put huge blocks of infantry into an early grave. You'll see it in this short little clip. He went from like, I don't know, 30 kills or so, up to over a hundred almost immediately and when he casts that reaper of souls his kills just start skyrocketing and you can see i mean there's a huge blob i got amazing value out of that particular spell that particular use because there was so much low tier infantry swarming at the giant's feet you're not going to see that every single time but it definitely deletes infantry and it's a great way to just charge in and quickly nuke stuff into oblivion so you saw zarkin ends up dying there but he goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with two giants and Skarsnik in a huge blob. So, that's impressive. Like, that is really, really impactful when you switch over to Zarkan again. It's all about that power spike. You aren't gonna get a lot of time when you switch over to Zarkan because his health degens so quickly. But what you can do is get a lot of value in that short amount of time. And I think that's exactly how Zarkan should function.
Maybe doesn't have a lot of stamina, but Slaneshi Demons can dish out a good old-fashioned pegan, that's for sure. But you guys are here for full battle, so let's head to the predatory jungles of Lustria and see what Malice Darkblade can do against the Lizardmen and Gorok of Issa. Lord Croak and Gorok coming in hot, spite Malice Darkblade ready to receive their charge, and we're going for a double Dusa build this game. So what we're going to try to do here is spread the field and kite with them. Allow them to fire as many of those whales of malice as possible. Get a lot of really good shots in. Enjoy the view and let those Scourge Runner chariots whittle down the opposition before we ever close into melee. Gorok is going to be a problem for the infantry. The Bleak Swords and the Dread Spears will crumble under the face of that assault. And Lord Croak, you know him well at this point. Every time he casts those spells, people are going to be... Dying. Pizza will be delivered, but the Sonic Boom is coming. Oh lord, it's coming. And the Siren of Red Ruin has a Song of Death to sing to the Skinks of Lustria. So, Malice Darkblade leading Hagrave into battle one more time. This time, we've got Shades. Long range armor piercing missiles, hopefully enough to take down the dinos quickly. They are extremely good against the Lizardmen when used well, and the double do sub build. So I was really excited to try this one out. They've got the Wolverine Claws, Weapon Axe coming in hot, channeling their inner lady Deathstrike, and Death by Snoo Snoo is on the menu this morning. Can anything stop their rampage? Game plan is pretty simple here. Do what we've done with them in every other match since getting early access. Transition between ranged and melee combat, keep them out of scary situations with dinos, Use that Whale of Malice for a 700 damage nuke in an AoE to all units caught in the blast, and just be a nuisance. Be a sneaky snake, like Kalita. But these ladies spit far better than even their venomous Tomb King's cousin. Soft might be displeased with that, but that is the truth. Dark Riders out on the flanks, and the Ravagers of Rakarth again. They have that snare for lower missile resist and lower speed for enemies in an AoE, so anything that gets close and tries to chase them down, like that Horn One or Cold One Cavalry will get shot up by that snare and by the Bonus Risk Large on their harpoons. It's a really good unit. I like this unit a lot. Doesn't have as much infantry killing power as Cold One Chariots, but got a lot of extra utility, which is what you like to see. So back here, Dark Sorceress with Soul Sealer, Word of Pain, and Power from Darkness. And Word of Pain is going to be so important for neutralizing the effectiveness of that Cold One Cavalry. And Gorok, the Great White Lizard, leads the legions of Itza. Shield of Eons and Mace of Ulamak. He's a world beater, or as much of a world beater as Footlords can possibly be in Total War Warhammer. Pretty scary. Lord Croak, his Deliverance of Pizza, going to delete the infantry in any cavalry that gets blobbed up. And he's got that Supreme Shield of the Old One. So we're going to want to stay very clear of him. Just a huge block, a legion of Saurus with shields, Cold One Cavalry in the rear, and they're going to be an issue because we don't have that much mobility. We have the one Scourge on our chariot, and we have the shades in the background, but it, oh my god, that's so brutal. To be fair, Deuces cannot do that to Saurus or anything that has a little bit more of a loose formation, but any of this light infantry that's compact, and really like tightly packed in there, like sardines in a can, they're just going to explode in blood bubbles of gloriousness. And Kane, very pleased with the way this battle is starting. So the Deusas are gonna try to reduce the numbers of those skinks. Shades can move up and get some good shots in as well. And their opening volleys will take that skink cohort all the way down past half HP. Maybe we'll charge into melee and teach them who's boss there too. They've got the speed, they've got the mass to push through, get some good charges in, and then escape, and not really worry about it. Skinks do not have the ability to stop them from moving around. Feral Bastilodons do, though, so we gotta be a little careful. And she just got RKO'd from behind, just got bullied, and the angry Ankylosaurus is not something she wants to deal with. It does have a bonus for infantry and not particularly amazing melee stats, but it's just not a trade that's worth taking, especially when it's backed up by all that infantry. So the Saurus are just pushing up the center with Gorok. This is how Gorok likes to play. Shades are going to try to whittle down those Feral Basilodons, and they'll do a good job at the start. Croak going to try to zone them out with a Deliverance of Pizza, and they will notice it and begin their escape. Already, Feral Basilodon is rampaging. 
I wish there was some friendly fire on those Croak abilities because it would have deleted the skin cohort from the game. But the Shades will have to move backwards and defending our back line is going to be really hard. Look at all this cavalry coming in and the Feral Basilodons, they can just go right to the center and bust through. So what we got to do is move the Medusas out to each flank, use their Whale of Malice and hope that's enough to turn it while the Scourge Runner Chariots just fire into all the Dinos, all the cavalry and whittle them down because the Shades are going to be under a tremendous amount of pressure as this battle starts. And as you can see, I'm not able to defend it all. There's just too much cavalry coming in. The Dark Riders can tie down some of them, but not all of them. And Word of Pain will certainly help out. You'll see me cast that right there. Minus 44 melee attack. Incredibly useful here, but still, they're a problem. I mean, there's more cavalry for the Lizardmen than there is for the Dark Elf. So the Medusas are going to cast that Whale of Malice. It is going to do really well here, and only a few models can actually attack her at any given time. So she's holding down that entire flank for me, while the Scourge Runner Chariots and the Ravagers of Karth fire in with their bonus for Swords projectile. But yeah, Bubble of Nope goes down, Dark Riders doing what they can, actually doing a very good job with the support of the Shades, but it's still getting pretty scary, because the Feral Basildons are free into the back line, and so is Lord Croak. And it's Malice Darkblade's time to shine, baby. Through hate, all things are possible, and even though some of his buddies are getting thrown up and down, by a bunch of cold one cav he can get in there with the warp sword of cane and start slicing on that ankylosaurus booty and with all his buffs popped yeah he's gonna beat up on a feral basilodon 1v1 no problem whatsoever and croak he's pretty yolo right now i'm honestly not really sure what he's doing moving into the dark elf back line here while the deuces are fighting and causing terror routes wherever they march and i this i mean it had to just be a misclick which happens all the time no big deal but it well, it kind of will be a big deal for Lord Croak here because now he has to fight Malice Darkblade on an island. And this is not where Croak thrives. This is not where Croak shines. This is not where you want Croak to be. He's not going to be able to beat the Tyrant of Haggrave all by himself. Gorok, the Great White Lizard, though, he's definitely making his presence felt in the center of all these Bleak Swords and Dread Spears. And that spinning shield of Eon's attack, the Mace of Ulamak will carve these Dark Elf shield walls asunder. Heads will roll, and the Great White Lizard gonna push through with all his Saurus compatriots. Back here, though, the cavalry for the Lizardmen are getting pooped on by the combination of Medusas, Dark Riders, and Malice Darkblade. And Lord Croak, well, he's gonna go join the Old Ones and the Warp. Good night, Sweet Prince. He is gone, and he is gone for good. One final deliverance of pizza will not clip anything. He's out of the fight. So the back lines have been cleaned up relatively well. Feral Basilodon is isolated and could be killed off here. Cavalry about to rout, but now it's really all about the infantry, and there are a ton of them pouring through the breaches in that Dark Elf shield wall. One of the Shades is still alive, ruling down the cavalry, and it should be able to finish off that unit very soon. There, it seems like they're routing towards the edge of the map, but the Saurus are another problem entirely, and they still have Gorok in support and he really hasn't taken any damage whatsoever. Feral Basilodon is going to rout Warp Sword of Cain, too much for him. More buffs popped on Malice Darkblade, or rather a debuff, the Demon's Curse, gonna lower the leadership and melee defense of that dinosaur, and the Sorceress, getting in there in close quarters combat, you know? She might not be wearing a lot of clothes, not wearing a whole lot of armor, but she can still get stuck in there and beat up on Skink, especially when she's backed up at the Siren of Red Ruin, who is once again living up to her name. Just a crimson wake left anytime she charges through these formations. And more terror routes for the Skink Cohort who managed to squeegee their way through. Scourge Runner Chariots are not in a good spot. Little bit of a micro-lapse there. They're getting caught out by an Ankylosaur when they really shouldn't. Got them under control. They're running now. And we're going to make sure all those dinosaurs that did route go all the way to the edge of the map because really don't want to deal with them. So now the Bloodrack Medusas have the opportunity to really make their presence felt because they have a lot of space. There's not a lot of mobility left for the Lizardmen. They can use their spiteful gaze, turn it on the infantry, and shoot the crap out of them. Anytime they manage to close with the melee, probably gonna get terror routed, but no reason to close in right now. Shade's got all their armor-piercing volleys coming in, and they can keep turning their gaze towards the opposition and shooting them from afar. No reason to wade into Sora Spears when you can shoot them from long range. So over here, looks like the Dread Spears and the rest of the Dark Elf infantry not going to be long for this world. 
but the shades have not been closed down yet, which is really important. One more whale going down that probably will be her last cast of that ability, but 600, 700 damage nuke on Sora Spear is pretty good. Gorok is a terror. I don't know how I'm going to deal with him yet. Malice Darkblade might not want to fight him in a 1v1. With Cycle Charging, maybe, but he's going to be backed up by Sora Spears. So, we're playing the kite game now, essentially. It's a really nice Soul Stealer. God, that hit everything. That was perfect. Gonna hit Gorok, gonna hit the Dinosaur, gonna hit all that infantry. She's gonna get a bunch of HP back. Like that, very, very much. Dark Rider is gonna charge into the skin cohort and bowl them over. Should be able to route the unit off the impetus of that slam. And welcome to the jam. Now, I wanted to try something here, and this is not something I would typically recommend. But I wanted to see what Malice Darkblade was all about in terms of his melee prowess. So I'm throwing him into the jaws of a bunch of Sora Spears, knowing that if things go really bad, I can unleash Zarkan and get him into the fight. So we're going to go into melee with all of our buffs popped and the debuffs on the Saurus Legions and let Spite munch on some Saurus. And he's going to get some nice snacks in, but overall, yeah, probably not ideal. Took a lot of damage on Malice. At the same time, though, it gave the Shades the time they need to fire into the unshielded side of all those Sora. So while it was probably not worth it overall, it wasn't a horrendous play. It is giving the Shades a lot of time to do what they want to do. And the Bloodrack Medusa, the Siren of Red Ruin, being chased by all of Itza, or all that remains of that army. In the woods, scooting and shooting, trying to get away from the Feral Basilodon and Gorok, who are trying to close the gap. And those Saurus are going to route, Shades going to route them with the help of some of those Blood Rack Medusa shots from the flank. Now, Malice is super low. Now we can unleash Zarkan, or we can think about it anyway. He wants to go in. You can see the demon is itching to get thrown in there, but we want to make sure everything else is gone. All the routing stuff is routed off the map entirely before we commit, because that HQ center, that command center for Itza, still looking pretty scary. Gorok is in there. The Dino's in there. There's even some cavalry coming back, and they are actually going to catch up to the Bloodrack Medusa. Shades have to go into melee at this point. Need something to provide a front line. And Malice, Darkblade, Bad Elf, McBlack Sword. Here we go. Well, about to, anyway. He's going to get stuck in there, charge into the middle of the formation, and that can get scary. I sometimes don't like those attack animations. They can get you in a really bad spot. But we're going to try to cast whatever spells we have. And then as soon as he gets really low or thinking about routing, Zarkan unleashed upon the world once more. The Drinker of the Worlds coming in hot. Here we go. We got the gray hair, that silver fox, thousands of years of pent-up aggression and angst. And the Druki. Well, he's going to be a demon today. And he's going to be mean. Bloodstorm and Reaper of Souls about to pop. He's going to go in there and try to 1v1 or 1v2 rather. Gorok. And a Feral Bastilladon. Now, can he take that fight? Yeah. Hell yeah. But he's still going to want some support. He can he can probably beat Gorok in a 1v1, even without Zarkan, I would think, with Cycle Charging anyway. Well, I don't know, actually. He has the Expert Charge Defense against Large. So maybe not. Uh, against most Footlords, Malice would have absolutely no issue whatsoever. But his HP is draining super fast. He took a tremendous amount of damage there that I wasn't really expecting to see. But Gorok is going to go down to him. And as you can see, the balance bar shifting heavily in the favor of Hag Grave. The Lizardmen will mass route, and that will be your battle. Zarkan eh, didn't get a massive amount of kills in that game, but he did what I needed him to do, which was help my Dark Riders turn the fight against the Cold One Cavalry and against the Feral Basilodons. And once those went down, once my backline was cleared up, Shades had time to fire in, and we had what we needed to push back the Lizardmen Tides and kill the children of the old ones. So that was yet another example of the Medusas putting the team on the back though. Again, I think Malice Darkblade was good. I think he's actually a pretty good Lord overall. I don't think he's gonna usurp Marathi's spot or Malachith's spot, but he's a solid Lord for sure. And he's got some pretty unique abilities too. I like his design. I think the way he's meant to be used is super interesting. And I love the fact that you have that small timing window where you're just an absolute monster. It makes for some really interesting, fun, and thematic gameplay. Thumbs up. Really enjoying it. Hope you guys did too.